Okay, so science and psychiatry in the late 19th century. The, de- the, the relationship and the development of the two things, the way that they became bound together, um, was very much a product of the way that German science organised itself in the 19th century. For whatever reason, Germany became the central place to explore the conditions that we're looking at, the major mental illnesses that we're looking at. You could say also that France had a claim as a centre for study, and it certainly did. But Germany really laid down the blueprint during this period. And I suspect that part and parcel of this reason, for the, of the reason for this, um, was the German model of doing science in general, which was a much, much better model than the British model of doing science. Critical to this was the development of the laboratory as a place to experiment and a place to teach. Now, there have been laboratories before the 19th century, but not in this sense of being a nexus between teaching and research interests. Not necessarily even located within universities. And that, as well, was a major achievement of the German system. Now, those of you that know your history will know that until... I think um, 1870 would be a good date. Up until the 1860s, Germany was a patchwork of states, principalities, kingdoms. You can see the patchwork there. But some of those states were more powerful than others. And the one that was most powerful of all was Prussia. And under the the Kaisers there and the um, uh, Bismarck in particular... Um, through a combination of force, persuasion, and then going in and giving the French a good kicking in the Franco-Prussian War, uh, defeating Austria as well, they were able to unite all of these German states together. But I think the critical part of this story is not so much the hegemony of Prussia, but the fact that these states... They, they were very urbane places. They were places that had many of the institutions that you associate with a modernising society. In particular, there were tonnes and tonnes of universities in Germany, far more than there were in England, which at this time only had two, actually three, once you factor in University College, the London University, uh, and uh, Scotland had four Uh, And that was about it, you know? Whereas Germany, you couldn't move from one sort of small town to another without tripping over another university. And it's in these universities that a new, more rigorous science emerges in the laboratory. University science develops the laboratory as the principal place to undertake scientific discovery. Well, you may wonder where it had been going on before. Well, it had been going on in people's living rooms, or it had been going on in the anatomy schools, or it had been going on in people's workshops. But very little of it, particularly in places like England, had been going on in what we might see as the laboratory. A new organisation and structure of science emerged at this time, epitomised by the work of of Justus von Liebig at Gießen, who in many respects can be regarded as the founder of modern chemistry, that combined a whole structure of professors, researchers, uh, doing their habilitation so they can become professors themselves, or researching for a higher degree. Students and teachers combined in one place, putting together distinct research projects. And it was in chemistry that this was really seen most of all during this period. So that picture's from around about 1840. So there's lots of universities in Germany. This model spreads throughout them, and it's driven forward as well by the catch-up that's going on. We know that Britain was the first industrial nation. We know that for much of the 19th century, 
It produced more than all the other nations put together. But towards the end of the 19th century, a number of countries were catching up. And in Germany, they harnessed science to the newly developing industries. Industries that were developing new forms of steam engines, steam power. And industries that were developing new form of mass dyeing techniques and stuff like that. And science was harnessed towards this drive and went a long way to pushing German science into a predominant position in Europe and almost the world. And it was also driven by Prussia's own warlike streak. It has to be said, I'm afraid, that Prussia did have a war culture. Their aristocratic class, called the Junkers, were all expected to serve in the Prussian army. If you like, the upper echelon of society was militarised. And they had a great deal of ambition to dominate Europe, which they tried to do in the First World War and then again in the Second World War, to unite Germany and to make sure that the French and the Russians didn't interfere with them. And the kind of research that could go on in places like Liebig's um, uh, laboratory would not be just geared towards organic chemistry. They had a very practical function that could be geared to new forms of explosive, new forms of killing people. You know, it opens up those particular realms. And it's um, hardly surprising then that as psychiatry emerged in the asylums, the Germans tried to harness that in their universities. In fact, what they do is they try to develop the same model in psychiatry as they do elsewhere. So it's laboratory-based, university-based, combines teaching and research, and on top of that, attach some form of clinic to the university. And so uh, what was generally happening was either they were being built, asylums were being built to link to universities, or uh, they were starting up their own institutions. Typical of these early figures was Wilhelm Griesinger, a highly eclectic man who trained under the great French physiologist Magendi, who in Britain was mostly known for animal torture. He was a great, I don't know if great's the right term, vivisectionist. So he had learnt a lot of his clinical science in Paris. In 1859, he was invited to Zurich in Switzerland, part of German-speaking Switzerland. And he was invited there to take charge of a psychiatric institution at the hospital and institute a laboratory for research disorders into psychiatric conditions. In other words, the German model. And then... I was just, just wondering... Oh, where did the picture go? I had a really nice picture of the Bergholzli um, asylum there. Um, those of you, you'll remember in Tutes, I mentioned a dangerous method. Do you remember that? Yeah? Um, the, that was where Jung worked, the Bergholzli it was where Bloiler worked, who we'll be seeing shortly, and it was established by Griesinger um, to be the clinical end of the university's psychiatry operations. I think it gives a clear indication of what's going on. And then, being an ambitious man, he moves on to Germany, establishes journals to publish the results, a great reformer, and he's best remembered for the laying down the maxim through he believed experiment that mental diseases mental diseases were brain diseases in other words mental diseases had to find their origin in something going physically wrong with the brain which of course provides a great research program for brain dissection to try and track down and find those lesions and uh, in many respects, certainly in the mid part of the 19th century, he becomes the dominant think figure in 19th century psychiatry, uh, right up until Kreppelin emerges. So the first biological psychiatry, 
That's the laboratory at West Riding. Uh, looks like a very busy place. Look at them, all of them at their microscopes, studying samples, maybe of blood, maybe of tissue, maybe of spinal cord, trying to track down lesions or abnormalities or chemical differences, anything that might indicate a cause for mental illness. Ah, there it is. I knew it was there somewhere. The, uh, I've left out the G, the Berg Holzli. I'm trying to say that right. It'd be Ho Holzli in Zurich, which was uh, greasing his baby. Um, in Europe, there was this drive, particularly in Germany, to link the asylum and universities uh, with teaching. A lot of it's directed towards lesion search. So, lesion search, uh, post mortem in the nervous system of uh, the patient, comparing it with the symptoms that they've experienced prior to their death. The classical clinical method of Paris, the uh, anatomical pathological method that we talked about in one of the earlier lectures, in fact one of the earliest lectures um, that looked at the way um, that uh, clinical thinking and uh, the, the you know, the birth of biomedicine occurred. And what I'm suggesting is once you've got the laboratory, once you've got it, once you're doing all of these things, it's almost inevitable that where they are going to be able to find lesions, which is in the nervous system, the spinal cord, and occasionally in the brain, it's going to hive off into neuro neurology, diseases of the nerves. And where they don't, it seems to be located very firmly in psychiatry, which doesn't mean that they stop looking for lesions because they go on looking and looking and looking. But it means that quite often they're looking, or for the vast majority of time, they're looking to no effect. So let's just have a deeper look at this process of sorting the neurological wheat from the... Now what about Kreplin? Let's get around to him or where the first biological psychiatry went wrong, question mark, it should probably be. Let's have a look at Emil Kreppelin, the making of a very modern psychiatrist. There he is, a man that uh, I think the psychologist says was the founder of psychology. He's very much educated in that mental diseases equals brain diseases school so he starts out with a very biological view of the way that psychiatry is uh, the way that mental diseases are produced and what psychiatry should do uh, the munich clinic that he goes to to train is dominated by brain anatomists like fleshig um, who shorter says was a tunnel vision brain anatomist i think we can take him at his word um, Kreppelin himself has a problem for this new biological psychiatry. He can't use a microscope. His eyesight's too dodgy. So he's going to have to develop other techniques. It's a bit like Freud. He couldn't do hypnosis. So he had to develop other means of getting into the mind. And that was where he went off looking at dreams. Um, it, Kreppelin starts out as an alienist in an asylum and then he's appointed a professor of psychiatry in Estonia. He quickly moves on to Heidelberg, where in 1890 he becomes a professor at the clinic and combines his interests in prognosis and psychology with anatomical studies. Like many before him, he assembles a stellar team, who include Nissel, who's a histolo histologist, and uh, our man, Alzheimer, who makes one of the single biggest biological breakthroughs that anyone had made by identifying a form of dementia, dementia um, that you could observe post-mortem in the brain. He was able to see the plaque and understand how it was causing dementia. Now, what was Kreppelin's big breakthrough? He was interested in human psychology, but in the 1880s, he developed a specific method, a method that meant that if you went into one of his institutions, one of his clinics, he started up a card on the patient. And during your time as a patient of Kreppelin's, he would record everything, every symptom, the length of time. He would gradually try to build up a prognosis 
for all of the conditions that he's observing. But more than that, it allows him to correlate different clusters of symptoms together, undertake almost proto-statistical analysis of this rapidly evolving data set. And he believed that this would allow him to understand the outcomes of mental illness, the prognosis, the way the disease will pro progress, as well as increasing the ability to identify what he believed were natural disease entities running beneath the symptoms. He's not really very interested in causation, although as we've already seen, he himself also adhered to theories that, um, that related to degeneracy. Now in the process of doing this, of collating all of his cards, he was able to distinguish manic depression from what was called dementia precox, which means precocious dementia, or dementia that comes on rather young. But it's also this method of observation, dis uh, description, and then correlation, which has nothing to do with microscopes, nothing to do with post-mortems, nothing to do with anatomy, and everything to do with observation. That the modern techniques that we use to construct the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual from the late 1960s after DSM-2, uh, it laid the groundwork for the development of those techniques. Now let's just quickly have a look at these con conditions at schizophrenia. It was discovered, it came together over a course of time. Nobody, we can go back in history and see people that we might retrospectively diagnose as schizophrenic, but there was no name schizophrenia. And really when you look at taxonomies, no way of actually identifying it in any of those older taxonomies that are produced by people like Esquirol. So Pinnell might have identified it. We know that in 1852, looking at a group of young adolescent men, Morel, who was the principal dr driver behind degeneracy theory, um, identified something that he called demence precoce, preco ah, forget it, my French is really dull, bad, uh, but you can see it, that's the French version of what becomes dementia precox, in other words, dementia setting on precociously. Um, in the 1880s, uh, Carl Carlborn comes up with the category hebephrenia when he's rewriting the classifications. This seems to be much closer to what becomes schizophrenia. Um, Carlborn is uh, operating out on a limb. Nobody's really doing what he's doing, and his reclassification at the time was ignored by psychiatrists, ignored by everyone except Kreppelin, uh, because many of the conditions Kreppelin went on to describe find their origins somehow in categories that Karl Baum had come up with, and hebephrenia was one of them. Uh, and then in 1887, Kreplin himself gives a detailed description. Uh, in 1891, it's named Dementia Precox, so it's given a Latin name rather than a French name. And then between 93 and 99, the full range of symptoms are described by Kreplin. And then in 1911, it's renamed schizophrenia by Eugen, Eugen, Eugen Bloiler, who's the head of the Berg Holzli at the time that he's doing this. Uh, and uh, it literally means split mind. And he wasn't thinking of multiple personality. What he was thinking of was a split between personality, thinking, memory and perception. That was where the mind was split. Moving quickly on to manic depression, bipolar. Once upon a time, we know there was only mania or melancholia, nothing in between. Mania, uh, melancholia, mm, glum. And then towards the middle of the 19th century, just after the middle, a couple of French guys get into a fight. One uh, has just described folia double form which means uh, madness that takes two different forms. And then uh, Fallere described folie circulaire, or circular madness. And they described it within two weeks of each other and then spent most of the rest of their lives fighting about who had discovered it, as is the way. 
And then Kalborm and his uh, sidekick Hecker are developing another category, which is cyclothemia. We, and, and you'll notice hebephrenia and cyclothemia uh, have been re-picked up in the DSM. There was a big gap when they weren't used as terms, but Spitzer's mob actually reintroduced them. And then, again, Kreppelin comes in. He's able to distinguish, finally, between dementia precox, a condition that sets on, as we know, schizophrenia tends to set on in adolescence, and is able to clearly distinguish that from manic depression, or what becomes bipolar. And hey presto, we now have the two major psychotic categories. So now we have the neuroses, which are things like depression, neurasthenia, hysteria, then the psychoses, schizophrenia, manic depression, and nobody really knows where to put epilepsy. Kreppelin guilty of murdering the first biological psychiatry? I think not. They go on doing biology, they go on pursuing the same techniques. Kreppelin's impact in his own time is debatable beyond redrawing up these categories. People continue, as we will see in the next lecture, trying to pursue the biological avenue. But, as I alluded to earlier, he creates a legacy that appeals to the small band of neo crepolinians who have a loathing of Freudian psychiatry. So his ghost is going to walk the planet until the 1960s, when he suddenly rises up again to have this amazingly profound effect upon diagnosis and ultimately therapy. Um,